It says in chapter 12, Peter Shemes Rebbe Pesuk Echad in verse 1, at that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation and even to that time. And at that time your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to everlasting contempt and shame. And those who are wise shall shine, like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness, like the stars, forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Then I, Daniel, looked, and there stood two others, one on the river bank, on this river bank, and the other on that river bank. And one said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, how long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? Then I heard the man who was clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, and he held up his right hand, and he held up his left hand to heaven. And he swore by him who lives forever, that it shall be for a time, times, and a half of a time. And when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all of these things shall be finished. And although I heard, I did not understand. And then I said, My Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said to me, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. Many shall be purified, made white, and refined. But the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand. But the wise shall understand. And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away, and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. But go your way. You go your way till the end, for you shall rest and will arise to your inheritance at the end of the days. Now, the interesting thing in Daniel chapter 12, of course, is that Daniel is having a conversation with an angel. And in fact, we see probably three angels there in this conversation that Daniel is having. Some people have said that maybe the one above the river, above the waters, was perhaps the Lord Himself. Some people say, no, it's another angel, but it's a special type of angel. Now, I, I want to tell you something about this chapter. It is the last chapter in Daniel, as you know. But we, we have just finished the book of Daniel, and the book of Daniel is probably the most important book in all of the Bible for the Jewish people. In all of the Tanakh, the book of Daniel is probably the most important book. Because in this book, we have seen God tell us the history of all of the empires of the world that would be until the end of time. 
and He told us before they existed. So we have confidence that the things that are being told in this book are from God because no one except for God knows the future. That's point number one. Point number two is that God then tells the exact time that the Mashiach, the Messiah, would come. You know if you have been coming here for the last few weeks that we have studied in chapter 9 verse 26 and verse 27 something called the 77s, the prophecy of the 77s. It was just two verses but the prophecy is so important because it tells the exact time that the Messiah would arrive. Our rabbis and sages, if you're Jewish today, understood that this prophecy was extremely important. They understood that it told and foretold the exact time that the Messiah would come. Now why is that important if you're Jewish? You know that one of the 13 tenets of the Jewish faith says that I believe in the Mashiach and I believe that he will come and even though he waits for a while I will wait anxiously for him. That's one of the 13 tenets of the Jewish faith today. And even then the sages and the Jewish people of that time had a great hope for the Mashiach to come because they saw the promises that he would give peace, that he would give salvation, that he would restore the kingdom to Israel, but they also saw prophecies that there would be a time in which the Mashiach would suffer as well. He would suffer in his mission, but in the end he would be a glorious king who would rule over all of the world and would restore righteousness in the world. Now I don't know about you, but if you look at the news today, if you look at the Itonim or the newspapers, Gam by internet and also Hakarashot by internet and also the news on the internet, you will see that the world is pretty sad. All over the world there are wars going on and there are things going on where people are killing each other, where people are doing terrible, terrible things. And today there are Islamic fundamentalists in all many, many nations of the world who are trying to kill innocent people because they want to have the world to themselves and be in power. And they think that their God will reward them for killing people. But our Bible tells us that mankind was made in the image of God. And that God told Noah, or Noah, and he told all of the early patriarchs that the shedding of blood was prohibited. It was forbidden because man was made in the image of God. And you are not to take the life and to take the blood of those who were made in the image of God. Man being made in the image of God makes us children of God. We're special in all of the species that exist on the planet. And he made us in his image with eternal spirit to be his children and for him to show his love too. But you know the story. We turned our back on him. In the garden we went our own way. And we turned our back on God and that broke his heart. But it also caused us to have a sentence of death in our lives. Because the prophet Yehezkel or Ezekiel had said in the Tanakh, the soul that sins it shall die. There is no way around that. God said in the book of Leviticus in the Torah, in chapter Shvasre or chapter 17, He said the blood is given you for atonement for your sins on the altar. And without the shedding of blood, 
There is no forgiveness of sins. So if you do not have the blood to cover your sins, like the blemish-free lamb at Pesach, the blood of that lamb put on the mezuzot or the doorposts of the house, if you do not have that blood, God cannot pass over you in judgment. Like he said in Pesach. He says, when I see the blood, I will pass over that house in judgment. So if you do not have the blood of the blemish-free Lamb of God on the doorposts of your house, your lev, a lev, and the heart, then when God sees your heart, He cannot pass over you in judgment. And so God knew that you needed a Savior. God knew that you needed a kippur or, or an atonement for your sins. He knew that you needed a blemish-free lamb to pay the price for your sins once and for all, forever. Because you see, when the Kohen Haggadol or the chief priest went into the holy place one time a year, it did not remove a person's sins forever. You know that, we know that, because he had to go back into the holy place every year. One year after another, after another, he had to return to the holy place and provide sacrifice for the sins of the same people. Because it was impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away completely the sins that exist in our lives. But God had said in HaTorah, in the book of Leviticus chapter 17, that the blood is given us for atonement for our sins on the altar and without the shedding of that blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. How sad the people must be today if they do not have the blood of the sacrifice that God provided to take away their sins. And some of the greatest Jewish sages that have ever lived have admitted at the end of their life that they do not know if they are going to heaven or hell. Yohanan ben Zakai, one of the greatest sages of all time, the father of all that we study today in Judaism today, at the end of his life when the students came in and they see him laying in his bed dying and he has tears running down his eyes from his eyes and they say oh great rabbi you are the pillar of Israel what is wrong why are you crying and you know I've told you the story before he said to them he said if I were going before an earthly king who only had the power to destroy my body but could not do anything to my soul, I would be afraid. I would be afraid of such a king. He says, but now I'm going before the king of the universe. I'm going before the great creator of all things. And he has the power to send me to heaven or to send me to hell. And before me there are placed two roads and one goes to heaven and one goes to hell. And he said with tears running down his face to his students, one of the greatest sages in Judaism, he said to them, I don't know which road I will go on. I don't know if I will be going to heaven and I don't know if I will be going to hell. I have very good Orthodox Jewish friends today. Some of them are like brothers to me. And I talk to them at times about the scriptures and I ask them, I say, do you know where you're going at the end of this life? And they get sad and they look down at the floor and they go, no, I don't know. How sad it must be to know that there is no atonement for your sins. Abraham taking his young son, Yitzchak, he was probably 13 to 20 years of age at that time, carrying the wood up to the mountains, 
because God had told Abraham Avinu, Abraham our father, to take his son and sacrifice him on this mountain. And on the way up there, Yitzhak was carrying the wood for the burnt offering and the sacrifice. And Abraham, being an old man, was walking along and Yitzhak said, Father, we have the wood and we have the fire, but where is the sacrifice? And Abraham said something we need to remember. He said, my son, God will provide for himself the sacrifice. You see, God does not need our works. God does not need our righteousness. God does not need our sacrifices that we try to make to be religious and holy before him. In fact, our sacrifices are like filthy rags before God. That's what the Tanakh says. Our righteousness is like filthy rags. We think we're so good. We think that we've done some good things and we bring them to God. And we say, look what I've done, God. Now I'm special. Now I can come into heaven. God says, no, you don't understand in the Tanakh. He says, your righteousness, the things that you think make you holy, those are like filthy, dirty rags in my eyes. All of our efforts fall so very short. It's like we are on the ground here and there is a great gap in the ground and the ground is here and it's over here one kilometer away. And this is high ground and that's high ground and we are standing up here but in this one kilometer there is nothing but a great hole in the ground. And we say, well I think that if I run fast enough maybe I can jump from here to there and I will not fall in the great hole in the ground. And we go back and we get our best running start and we are running so fast because we are young at this time and our hair is blowing back in the wind because we are young at this time and we still have hair. And we're just giving it our best effort and we take off and we put our foot right on the edge and we jump high into the air and maybe we go the best people in the world may go shesh meter omashu, six meters or something, 20 feet or something. And then the Olympic champions can go about 28 feet. Okay, so maybe sheva uh, shmone meter omashu, maximum. And then we start falling in the hole in the ground because it was not enough. And the rest of us, some only jump one meter. Some jump two, some jump five, some jump eight. But it's never, ever enough to get way over there. All of our efforts fall so very short. And we try so hard. Your Heavenly Father, my Heavenly Father, knows that our efforts will never be enough. And so He knew the future back then and he knew that he would have to provide another way for us to be restored to him and so he says I know what I will do I will become a man I will allow myself to be born in the body of a little infant I will grow up keeping the Torah all of the time Kolesman, for one reason and one reason only that he would qualify according to the Word of God that he would qualify as an acceptable sacrifice for our sins so that he could pay the price for our sins because no other sacrifice was good enough you see if it was good enough then the chief priest would not have to do it every year the same sacrifice year after year after year. If it was good enough, then Hakohen Hakadol, who lo hayat sarik lasot hazeh shana shana shana, all of the time. 
He would do it once and it would be misspeak or it would be enough, but it was never good enough and God knew this. So he said, I will become a man. I will keep the Torah at all times so that I will be without spot, without blemish, so that I will be an acceptable sacrifice before the throne of God for the sins of man. And when God sees that the sins of man have been paid for, then man can come back into the presence of God. Because it is impossible to stand in the presence of God while we have sin. God told Moshe, Moshe, the most righteous and holy man in all of the Tanakh, in all of the Torah. And God told Moshe, Moshe, no man, nobody, Afichad, nobody can see me and live. If Moshe cannot see God and live, then what hope do I have? What hope do you have before the throne of God? If Moshe was not holy enough to see God and live on his own righteousness, then how can you and I expect to see God and live? And God knew that this was a problem. And so he became the sacrifice. He became the sacrifice. He allowed himself to be born into the body of a, a human being, a bin Adam. And to grow and keep the law at all times so he would qualify to be the acceptable sacrifice. And then when it got to that point in his life, he allowed himself to be killed for us. Nobody stopped his plan. It was his plan to give his life. And his plan succeeded. His plan was accomplished. His plan was completed. And his plan saves you and I today, all who believe in what he did at that time on the cross of Calvary. The greatest love story that was ever told. And the whole Torah, the whole Tanakh, pointed to this time in history in which God would become a man and live his life and become Hakepur or the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the world. So that all mankind could be restored to relationship with Almighty God, the Creator. All of the Tanakh pointed to this time. And now here we are in the book of Daniel. And after God shows much of the history that will occur throughout the history of man's governments, with the Babylonian Empire, followed by the Medo-Persian Empire, followed by the Greek Empire, followed by the Roman Empire. He showed all of those things hundreds and even thousands of years before they occurred. He showed it all. And he did that to impress you. He did that so that you would understand who was speaking to you. You see, Daniel, the book of Daniel, is not just a book that some man wrote. Because nobody ever has known the future like that to where they could predict all of the history of mankind hundreds and even thousands of years before it occurred. No. Daniel Hanavi was a man of God who was given a message by angels of God from the Spirit of God and Daniel Hanavi or Daniel the prophet wrote these things down. And the book of Daniel is so important especially if you are Jewish today. It's important to everybody in the world because it tells of the power and the glory and the plan for salvation of Almighty God. And it tells about what will happen in the last days, the days in which you and I live. It tells all of these things. It is probably one of the most important books in all of the Bible. And if you're Jewish, it is certainly one of the most important books in all of the Tanakh. It's so important because it told what would happen in history so that you would know, so that you would understand that these words are not from man. They are from God. 
Because nobody knows the future but God. And so God told you. He told us what things would happen. And now you and I, from this point in time, from where we are today, we can look back at history and we can know that those words that were spoken of in the book of Daniel must have been from God because they came true. And all of those empires that were prophesied, the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, and the Roman Empire after that, they all came and they all went exactly in the order, exactly at the time, exactly in the way that God said they would. Today, that is no longer prophecy. Today, for you and I, that is history. And so God proved that He was the author of the words in the book of Daniel. But then the next thing He did in chapter 9 was He said, Okay, now that you know who I am, I'm going to tell you something extremely important. Now that you know that these words are from God, I'm going to tell you something that is the most important thing that you can know in all of the Tanakh, in all of the Bible. I'm going to tell you when the Mashiach is going to come. I'm going to tell you how you can know who the correct Mashiach is. I'm going to tell you exactly when he's going to arrive. And you may remember that we went over this lesson. I'm only going to touch a little bit about the mathematics of it today. But if you want more details, you can go back and it's on the internet. And it's called the 77s. And it's the prophecy given in Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 and 27. It is impossible to misinterpret the 77's prophecy. If you use what is called in Judaism the Peshat or the simple and obvious interpretation just like you would anything else in the Bible or anything else that you read in any book you will understand without a doubt the exact time frame that the Mashiach was to come. The prophecy had said, given by the angel Gabriel to Daniel Hanavi, or Daniel the prophet, he had said, 70 weeks are determined for the holy city and for your people. And he says, from the time of the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild the streets and the walls of Yerushalayim, until Mashiach Hanagit, or Messiah the prince, there will be seven sevens plus sixty-two sevens. Seven sevens. He said that there would be a prophecy of seventy sevens altogether. The words in the Hebrew of course are Shavim Shvim. Seventy. Shavim. Shvim. Sevens. Seventy sevens. Christian and Jewish scholars today agree that this was talking about years. Seventy periods of times. Seventy groups of sevens. And each one of these sevens was one year. Seventy times seven is four hundred and ninety years. Abamot beteshim shana. Four hundred and ninety years. But Gabriel the angel had said to the prophet Daniel, he says, from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild the streets and the walls of Yerushalayim until Mashiach the Prince, there will be seven sevens plus sixty-two sevens. That's simple math. If you add the seven sevens plus the sixty-two sevens, you come to sixty-nine sevens. Oh, Shishim Betesha Shana. Uh, Shishim Betesha. Okay, sixty-nine sevens. Shishim Betesha Shvim. Beyachad Kamashani. How many years together? Sixty-nine sevens is sixty-nine 
times 7 is abamot shmonim v'shalosh shana 483 years we know from the book of Nehemiah or Nehemiah that the command to restore and rebuild the walls and the streets of Yerushalayim went forth in what we call 445 BC or before common era if you want during that time King Artaxerxes Longeminus who had been crowned king in 465 BC it says in the book of Nehemiah that in the 20th year of his reign that would be 445 BC he gave Nehemiah permission to organize something that would make it possible to go and rebuild the walls and the streets of the city Yerushalayim now some 80 something years before that Cyrus the anointed had given the command and the temple was already being restored but the walls and the streets of Yerushalayim were still in ruins and if you read the first chapter in the book of Nehemiah or Nehemiah you will understand that the reason why Nehemiah was sad was he got a report from his brother who visited Yerushalayim that the streets were all torn up and that the walls were torn down and that the gates were still burned that the temple was okay it was coming along there was Kadima, there was progress there in the temple but the streets and the walls and the gates were all torn down and the city did not have any way to defend itself because there was no wall around the city and the gates were not there and the rocks that were in the roads were so large no one could lift them and it was just a terrible terrible sight Jerusalem was still in ruins even though the temple was being worked on from the command to restore that earlier in the time of Cyrus so Nehemiah gets this report in the first chapter of Nehemiah and he starts being sad before the king and the king Artaxerxes Longeminus asked him why are you sad and he tells him he says my city is in ruins and Artaxerxes Longeminus had compassion on him he says listen I will give you permission to go and rebuild the city I will give you permission to take supplies and to take people and you can go and restore the city that command given in the second chapter of the book of Nehemiah in the Tanakh was given in the 20th year of the reign of Artaxerxes Longeminus the Tanakh tells us that that command was given in the 20th year of his reign we know that he came to power in 465 BC 20 years into his reign would have been 445 BC the prophecy had said from the time that the command to rebuild and restore the streets and the gates and the walls of Jerusalem from the time that that command was given until the time that the Mashiach would come would be 69 sevens seven sevens plus 62 sevens we know from history it took 70 I'm sorry it took seven sevens or 49 years one generation just to clean up everything and restore the streets and get those huge rocks and stones out of the way and to rebuild the walls of Yerushalayim and to rebuild the Rechavod or the streets of Yerushalayim so it took seven sevens just to rebuild it and he said Ve'od Shishim Shnaim Shana in 62 years more plus the seven sevens 62 sevens more until the Messiah will come now if you add that up the seven sevens 49 years plus the 62 sevens comes up to be Bidyuk Mamash Abamo Shmonim Veshaloshana 483 years exactly 
precisely. From the time that that command was given in 445 BC, if you count forward 483 years, you say, well, what's a year? Fortunately, we know from the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis tells us that the day that Noah entered the ark, that the waters started coming on the earth and prevailed on the earth, and it says that that was in the second month and the seventeenth day of the second month. And then if you read on down it says the waters prevailed on the earth for 150 days. 150 days the waters prevailed on the earth until the ark came to rest on the mount of Erat. On the mountains of Erat. And then it said it came to rest on the seventeenth day of the seventh month. The seventeenth day on the seventh month is when Hasefer Bereshit, or the book of Genesis, said it came to rest. So if it started and they prevailed on the earth on the seventeenth day of the second month, and that they prevailed on the earth until the seventeenth day of the seventh month, and in that same verse it says, Therefore the waters prevailed, or 150 days, then it's an easy thing to take five months and divide them into the 150 days, and you come up with the fact that each month had shloshim yamim, or 30 days. Bidyuk, mamash. Exactly, precisely 30 days in each month. So, if you take 483 years using a calendar, using these prophetic, biblical, Torah, Tanakhi months of 30 days, you will find that that is 173,880 days exactly. Now remember that number. Mea Vishivim Vishalosh Elif Shmonamot Shmonim Yamim Bidyuk Mamash. One hundred and seventy three thousand eight hundred and eighty days is what that four hundred and eighty three years comes to. When you add the seven sevens plus the sixty two sevens, you come up to sixty nine sevens. Each of the sevens is one year. That means 483 years. 69 times 7. 483 years. What happened 483 years after Artaxerxes gave this command to restore and rebuild Yerushalayim? What event happened in history? 173,880 days later, Mamash Bidyuk, exactly, precisely, 173,880 days later, after that command to restore Jerusalem was given, a man named Yeshua got on the colt of a donkey and he rode into Yerushalayim and the crowds proclaimed him to be the Mashiach. There is no other event that happened that day that was as big as that event in history. There was no other man who ever lived whose life changed the history of all the world like this man Yeshua. His life split time itself into two parts. And today, whether you're Jewish or not, you all have calendars that show what happened before his life and what happened after his life. Now, I know we have a Jewish calendar that does not show that, but most of the Yehudim also have a calendar that keeps it just the same as a one that shows it before common error and after common error. Or whether you say it's before the Lord or after the Lord. It doesn't matter because his life changed time itself. 
His life split time itself into two parts. His life was the most significant life of any person who ever lived in all of the history of all mankind. And certainly there has never been a more famous Jewish person that ever lived other than Yeshua. His life affected history of the whole earth more than anyone who ever lived. And his life has affected the lives of tens of billions, not millions, billions of people through the history of the earth. More than any man who ever lived. And he, as the prophecy had spoken that he would, rode this little foal, a colt of a donkey into the city of Yerushalayim exactly 173,880 days after the command to restore and rebuild the walls and the streets of Yerushalayim had gone forth from the book of Nehemiah by Perikstein, chapter 2. If you're Jewish and you look at that and you take the time to calculate it, you go, this is amazing. Take the time to calculate. You said, why don't the rabbis know this? It's a very good question. I'll tell you. The ones who have done the calculations usually now believe in Yeshua. There were a few rabbis There were a few rabbis that say, no. They say it's forbidden to make these calculations. One of the rabbis said in the writings, in the Talmudic writings, because if they make these writings, they will know. That's what he said. A man who I have a great deal of respect for, Harambam, Rambam, Maimonides, one of the greatest Jewish sages of all time. He didn't say it was forbidden, really, to calculate, but he says, don't do it because we don't know. We don't know. Some of the rabbis who made these calculations, just like I just did with you, some of them said, well, what are we going to do? Because according to these calculations, the time for the Messiah to come has already passed, and He did not come. What are we going to do? He was supposed to come today. He was supposed to come then, but He did not come. Oh, He came. We were looking for the wrong person. We were looking for the great, great general who was going to free us from the Roman occupation. Who was going to... He was going to restore the kingdom to Israel from the Roman occupation. And certainly the prophecies had spoken of the great general king who was going to be the great military king. But it also spoke of the suffering servant, Mashiach ben Yosef. Nahan. And certainly nobody in the Old Testament suffered like Joseph did. He was sold into slavery in the land of Egypt by his brothers, left for dead till his father was told that a wild animal had killed him and tore him apart. And he was put there away from his family in a strange land for all those years. And so some of the rabbis said, well, there's a Mashiach that's going to suffer. And some of them said, well, yeah, but there's also a Mashiach that's going to be the ruling, reigning king Mashiach. Hamelech David, or Mashiach bin David. Okay, the king Mashiach, and also the suffering Mashiach. Mashiach bin Yosef, be Mashiach bin David. Easy. So some of the Messiahs thought, well, which one is he? Some of the, I'm sorry, some of the sages thought, well, which one is he? And they said, well, maybe there's going to be two. And then some of the rabbis said, no, I think it's going to be the same one. But he will suffer first, and then afterward he will be the king. Some of them knew. But they could calculate the time, and the ones who calculated the time were very, very smart. They were very wise because then they knew exactly when the Mashiach was to come. And if you read your Bibles, even Habrit HaKadoshah, you know that all the people at that time, when that time had expired, you know that all of the women were naming their sons after the name that they thought the Mashiach would be called. 
and they wanted to have the honor of being the mother or the one to give birth to the Mashiach. And they all expected it and they all looked forward to it because they knew exactly when it was to happen. What day, what month, what week, what year it was to happen. And so everybody in the Jewish community were thinking, this is cool, the Messiah is going to come any day now, any day now he's going to come. Because of the prophecy of Daniel. And everybody was happy. Because the Romans were beating them down and they were occupying them and they were persecuting the Jewish people and the, and the Jewish people just kept going, oh, oh, this is going to be good. He's going to be here any day now. They knew when he would come and they were expecting it. And I disagree with the sages that say it is forbidden to calculate it. And here's why I disagree with them. Because Gabriel, the angel, when he gave this message to Daniel, he says, now I want you to know and I want you to consider and I want you to understand. So who is this now that's telling us it's forbidden to know? Who is it that's telling us it's forbidden to consider? Who is it that's telling us it's forbidden to understand? When the angel said, I want you to consider, I want you to know it, and I want you to understand it. So think about it. Spend some time. Consider it. Think about it. Pray about it. Because God will cause you to understand if you just try. He told the exact time that the Mashiach would come. That's the second great thing in all of the book of Daniel as we go over this summary today. And let's end up on these last two things. Then God in chapter 10 and 11 gives the most detailed prophecy that has ever been given in anything. But certainly the most detailed prophecy that's ever been given in the Word of God, in the Bible, in the Tanakh. He tells four kings that are coming in the future. He even tells who they're going to be. He tells where they will reign. Some of them are going to be kings over Assyria and the Seleucid Empire. Others are going to be kings in the Ptolemies and the Egyptian Empire. And he even tells that one of the kings from the south is going to send uh, one of his daughters to marry the king in the north in the Seleucid Empire. And he's going to tell about the wars they have with each other, where they're going to fight these wars, and how each of these wars are going to turn out with each of these kings. He's going to talk about how navies are going to fight each other, which one's going to win. And in the chapter 11 of the book of Daniel alone, there are over 120 specific prophecies given. And every one of them were fulfilled. Exactly in their time. Except for one at the end that talks about the last days. Every one of these were fulfilled. Mamash biduk exactly, precisely as they said they would be. So that's the third thing. So what does that mean? Well, the first thing in the book of Daniel, God shows Daniel four world empires. He says, look, here's proof that I'm God. Nobody knows the future but God, right? So here's proof. I will tell you what's going to happen in the future. Here's the four world empires that are going to come about. The Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire. Here's how long they're going to stay on the scene. Here's how they're going to start. Here's how they're going to end. And we know these things from chapter 7 and chapter 2 of the book of Daniel. And then he gives this great prophecy about the 77s to know exactly when the Messiah was going to come. Now why is this important? Because the Messiah is the one who will save us. The Messiah is the one who will restore us to God. And God knew that Satan or the devil would try to lie to people. He knew that the enemy, the devil, would try 
to tell people, no, that's not the Messiah. It's this man over here. It's Bar Kokhba. It's somebody else. It's Schneerson from New York. It's somebody else. There have been 27 different Jewish people who claim to be the Messiah over the last 2,300 years. 27 different people. Only one man did what was written in the scriptures. In his life, this one man fulfilled 325 at least prophecies of the Tanakh. When he was born, he fulfilled them. When he rode into Yerushalayim at exactly the right time, on the cult of a donkey, he fulfilled many more. And when he died on the cross, he fulfilled many more. And when he rose from the dead and his body cannot be found, he fulfilled even more. But there's another prophecy about this man. The prophecy that he will return. And so God has told us, look, be very careful in the book of Daniel. I am the one giving you this message. See, I've showed you the four world empires that are happening. I've showed you the exact time that the Messiah will come. So pay attention. Calculate it. Understand. Know. And consider what is being said. And then after that chapter 9, he says all of these detailed prophecies in chapter 11. And God is saying simply like, you think that was something that I told you about the four world kingdoms? Watch this. Now I'll tell you about 120 other things that are going to happen in the next few hundred years. And when you see them, you're going to go, oh, this is what was written in the book of Daniel. 375 years before it happened and now all of these things are happening 120 prophecies exactly as God said they would wow that certainly must have been God who spoke those words and that's very important because the fourth thing he tells you is in the chapter that we read today the last thing that he tells you the way all of this ends, basof, the way all of this ends is God is going to tell you now that at the time that Michael shall stand up, going to chapter 12 now in verse 1 again, he had said in the last verse of the previous chapter in chapter Echadisre or 11, it says, and he shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end and no one will help him. Now that is about the false Messiah. God is telling you all these secrets, all these key things, so that you would know exactly where you are in time, so that you would know exactly who is speaking to you in the words of this book, because there is also going to come a false Messiah. And he will come in at first with peace. And he will come in lying and he will pretend to be a friend of the Jewish people. And he will confirm a covenant with them for three and a half years according to these prophecies that we've read in the last three chapters of the book of Daniel as we've studied before. And he will appear to be a friend of the Jewish people. But in the middle of this last seven years, remember we said there were 69 sevens until the true Mashiach came? But now there is one more seven, group of seven years, of which the book of Daniel speaks. And he speaks of this seven years as a warning. He says, because there is going to be in this last seven years of time a false Mashiach one who comes in lying one who comes in looking like a man of peace but then he's going to turn his back on the people of Israel and he's going to persecute them and he's going to try to kill and destroy the Jewish people now if you're Jewish and I'm Jewish too I understand this I know our history you know our history you know that I was raised in a Jewish family, but I did not really know what that meant. So I had to catch up later. I had to go through all my training and all my school and everything later to learn what happened to our people in, his, in history, may historia. 
But you know and I know that it has never been an easy life for the Jewish people. That there have been attacks from Satan many, many times throughout the history of the Jewish people to try to destroy them. Why is that? Why is it that Satan tries to destroy our people so much? Because he knows if he can wipe out the Jewish people, if he can destroy the Jewish people, he knows he will beat the plan of God. He knows he will succeed against the plan of God. He knows that God will not be successful in his plan and that God's word will not be found to be true if Satan can defeat God's word. And so he tries to wipe out the Jewish people because so many of the prophecies of God's word have to do with the Jewish people and the land of Israel. That's why this tiny, tiny piece of land today is at the top of the list of all of the governments of all of the world today. That's why the people of all of the world today considered the problem of Israel to be the biggest problem in the world today. It's not a problem. God gave us the land. God brought us here back to the land. No problem. But there will be a false Messiah. And if you do not believe the true Messiah, if you do not know, if you do not consider, if you do not understand when the true Messiah was supposed to arrive, you probably will fall for the false Messiah. And you will think he is just the greatest thing and that he's a friend of the Jewish people, but after three and a half years of looking like a friend, he will turn into the son of Satan himself. And he will destroy more Jewish people than have ever been destroyed in any other point in time of history. And he will try to destroy the land. So this is extremely important, this message that we read about in Daniel 12 today. Because God is warning us He's telling us what to watch out for and He's telling us what to do. It says in chapter 12 verse 1, At that time, when this man, this false Messiah, turns his back on Israel, and he becomes known for what he really is, it says, At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble, it says in the Tanakh, in the book of Daniel. There shall be a time of trouble such as there never was since there was a nation. Even to that time, and at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. Now, pay attention. Shema. Listen to what I'm saying. This false messiah will make a time of trouble unlike any time of trouble that the Jewish people have ever, ever experienced. You say, well I thought the Holocaust, Hashoah, was the time of trouble, the greatest time of trouble. You are right. You know my name, Apple. You know that my name is Stephen Apple. There are thousands of Apples who were killed in the Shoah. I don't know how many were my relatives. I understand that the Shoah was terrible, but the Bible in the book of Daniel today, in chapter 12, seems to be saying there will be another time that is even worse than that. He says a time that is greater trouble than any other time that has ever been since there ever was a nation until the end there will never be a greater time of trouble than this. And it says that many who are asleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now, it says that Michael, the great prince that stands guard over this land, over the people. Remember in chapter 10. In chapter 10 of the book of Daniel, an angel comes to Daniel and he starts telling him all this stuff about what 
He's been doing. Now usually angels come to you with a message. Lo and behold, here is the word of the Lord. To you this word is given. And here's... But this angel said, wow, really took a while for me to get here. Sorry about that. I was battling this other angel, the prince of Persia. You remember that? In chapter 10, the prince of Persia? Noticed he was not called the chief prince of Persia. He was called the Tsar or the prince of Persia. It was an angelic being and he was trying to influence the kings of Persia because there were two at that time and others who would come after them. And so this angel says, I've been doing battle with the prince of Persia. But now he says that the great prince, that is Sar Hagadol, be of read. Sar Hagadol in Hebrew is prince, the great, prince, the large, the great. So I want you to understand that Persia had a normal prince, angel. But Israel has a chief prince. There are only a couple or more archangels before God. They are much more powerful than a regular angel. Isn't it interesting that God saw that there was a regular satanic angel, a follower of Satan who fell from heaven when Satan was kicked out of heaven. A regular angel was the prince of Persia, but a chief prince is the prince that stands guard over our people, Israel. Isn't it interesting? He's a Sar Hagadol, or the prince, the chief. A yeah, mighty, mighty warrior. If you read the book of Revelation in Habreda Chadashah Basof, Habreda Chadashah, you understand from the last book of the New Testament, you understand that Michael is the guy who kicks Satan out of heaven. There's never been a greater warrior. A single angel in the Torah killed 180,000 people against the camp of Israel in one night. 180,000 people. But Michael is the guy who kicked Satan out of heaven and all of his other angels. This man, this angel, is a warrior like you cannot imagine. And he is the one that stands guard over the promises of God, over the people of God, over the land of God, and he will not let Satan have his way here. But, it says first, as we look at this, he says, until the power of the holy people be broken. It says in verse 7 in chapter 12, Then I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river when he had held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven, and he swore by him who lives forever that it would be that it would last for time, times, and half a time. Time was one year. Times is two years, more than one, two years. Pa'maim, shanaim, and half a time, chetzi shana. Time, the old times, the old chetzi shana, the shalosh for chetzi shana, nochon, biachat. Three and a half years together. And he says, it will be for three and a half years until the power of the holy people has been completely shattered. All of these things shall be finished. Now, see, Ariel Sharon, when he was the Prime Minister, and I prayed for him, and I prayed for him then. But one day he said something that scared me. He said, history has shown us that we can trust nobody but ourselves. You know, I know how he meant that. And I agree, he can trust no man, he can trust no country, that they must try to defend themselves. I understand that, but I think that the Bible has shown us that we can trust God and that we cannot trust ourselves. And now this angel is telling Daniel that the end of it all will happen when the power of the holy people 
is completely broken. Sometimes we must be brought to the point to where we have nothing else to rely on. Sometimes we must be brought to the point to where we have no other options before we will turn to God and say, God, help me. And this time of trouble that will be greater than any time of trouble that has ever been since there was a nation, nor ever will be, this time of trouble will be that time. Now how can you avoid that time of trouble? You can know from the words in the end of this book, it says the 1,290 days. If you live during that time of trouble, according to the book of Daniel, you can know when the Lord is going to return and judge the earth and destroy this false Messiah. Because this false Messiah, at the end of three and a half years of pretending to be the friend, he will demand that people worship him. He will claim that he is God and he will stand in the temple requiring everyone who is living at that time to worship him and those that do not worship him will be killed according to the Tanakh, according to the prophecies of the Tanakh and also Habir Kharashah, Shneim, both of them. But there is another time when the Lord says he will come but not touch the ground but he will come in the clouds and he will snatch his people he will take his people away suddenly in a moment in the twinkling of an eye in the blink of an eye twinkling of an eye like that and all who believe on his Mashiach the true Mashiach will be taken to heaven with him and they will just watch as all of this happens and the judgment of God is poured out and this false Messiah starts killing all these people. But we will be safe in heaven with God. You don't have to be here when this false Messiah is here. You don't have to pay for your belief with your life at that time by not worshiping Him. You can believe in the true Messiah today. So the whole thing in all of the book of Daniel. Children, brothers, sisters. Simply four messages. He told us the four kingdoms that would rule the world. He says, now do you understand who's talking to you? It's me, right? It's God because only I know the future. And we said, okay. He said, now listen. I'm going to tell you exactly when the true Messiah will arrive. Pay attention. You can know. You can understand. Don't listen to people when they tell you. Don't try to understand. You can know. I want you to know. I want you to consider. I want you to understand like the angel said to Daniel. And he says to us in the book of Daniel. So you know when the true Messiah came. What happened at that time? Yeshua came. He gave his life. He changed the world more than any man who ever lived. Now God says, okay, now remember that. Now I'm going to tell you some really detailed stuff. I'll tell you 120 prophecies that are going to happen over the next 375 years. And they happened. Just like that. Bidyuk mamash exactly, precisely. Because God says, now I'm going to tell you the last thing. The last thing is there is going to be a false messiah. And he will look like a friend at first but then he will be your worst enemy. Don't fall for him. He says, I've told you, I've proved to you that I am God. i proved to you that what I'm saying in the book of Daniel is a message from God. I've told you when the true Messiah is coming. And I've told you what's going to happen when the false Messiah is coming. And you know that this all is a message from God because I gave you the prophecies and you saw them come to pass. So now you can believe me about the time when the true Messiah comes and the time when the false Messiah comes. You, Yehudim, the Kulam, you can know the truth. Now you have a decision to make. Do you want to be here at the times of trouble? Or are you going to believe in the true Messiah and be before the throne of God in the hand of God while all of these troubles are occurring on the earth? 
And then after the time of those troubles, when that last seven years has ended, the Lord will return with you, by the way, to this earth and set up His kingdom. Destroy all unrighteousness and rule and reign in righteousness. The book of Daniel is the story of time. It's a story of prophecy. It's the story of salvation. It's your chance to know Him. Don't wait. Believe on the true Messiah.